Welcome to CN Live's ongoing coverage of Julian Assange's extradition hearing at Old Bailey in London. This is Joe Loria reporting for CN Live. Today was day 13. We are still on the medical issues, mostly psychological, but today also his physical conditions. And to see Julian in the Julian Assange in that glass cage while he's being talked about in this way. Uh, it became quite emotional today, particularly the description of his physical conditions by Dr. Sandra Crosby. But before we get to that, I was at the end of the day of testimony. We had only one other witness today, and that was a prosecution witness, the second one, and the only the second one. They were only calling two. This is another forensic psychiatrist. His name is Nigel Blackwood. He's with the National Health Service. And he was brought basically to refute everything that was said by Michael um, Koppelman, thank you, Michael Koppelman, who was a defense witness uh, who made various statements about Julian Assange suffering from a severe depression and having a high risk of suicide, of having uh, being on the autism spectrum and suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, Blackwood refuted all of those four points in his time on the stand with James Lewis in the role now of direct examiner, not cross-examiner. That was done by Fitzgerald. And during Fitzgerald's cross-examination, there were two really kind of major dramatic moments. I don't know if there were bombshells, but they were sort of gotcha moments where he exposed the witness for the prosecution. Blackwood, I'll get to that in a moment. Just to go over briefly, Blackwood said, um, again, that he only suffered from moderate depression, not severe. He, By the way, he had uh, examined him back in March of 2020, I believe, it was 2020, and he wrote his report in April. He saw him twice, and he had a total of four hours of conversation with Assange at Belmarsh Prison. So he has no post-traumatic stress, no autism traits, not a high risk of suicide. He says, yes, that he's talked about suicide, but he thinks it's calf can be carefully managed and treated. And that this is key. He thinks Julian Assange can resist the impulse to kill himself. That he, uh, with the medical, with the medication, with the uh, psycho psychological treatments, he not being in isolation anymore. That this, can, this feeling of Assange to kill himself, which we heard a lot more about a little bit later, would be uh, controlled by Assange and. He also said at one point, uh, this was an interesting, and I want to read it directly, the whole quote from Blackwood. He, he testified that uh, in speaking with him in these four hours that Assange could concentrate, his gestures and posture were appropriate, that he becomes animated about the political nature of his trial and his expected treatment in the United States. And he gets animated and speaks in detail in a monologue, but can be, can be interrupted about these things. He, Blackwood goes on to say he considers me naive about my understanding of his case. And Assange said Koppelman did not give a did not have a political dimension to his report. So he was very keen to give me the political dimension and to try to exercise editorial control over my report. So Assange there is quite uh, aware in that case anyway of speaking to these two uh, doctors, and there were many who examined him. And that was another part of the direct examination by James Lewis, where he once again went over these prison notes from each month, starting from 2019, that uh, Assange was in Belmarsh. And each of these prison notes were from examinations by doctors there who said uh, he was alert, he made good eye contact, he had good humor, he was uh, playing pool, you know, basically making it out that he's completely normal, that he has some uh, moderate or mild depression, and sometimes he thought about suicide, but nothing to worry about. It could all be managed, he's fine, everything's fine. And Koppelman rejected all of that, but of course this is why Lewis brought Blackwood on the stand today, so that he could confirm all of these notes from the prison that there was basically nothing to worry about, and Assange uh, was not suffering from all of these ailments that the defense was saying, uh, although we didn't hear Lewis bring up the idea that he was malingering, in other words, faking it, which was quite 
uh, a disturbing moment in yesterday's uh, testimony. That was pretty much what Blackwood had to say, and, and that was the reason he was brought there, and he fulfilled his purpose for the prosecution. And then Edward Fitzgerald, for the defense, got a crack at uh, cross-examining him. And I say his style of cross-examination is quite different than Lewis, um, but I think he's as good as Lewis is, and he's politer about it. But he was very forceful, and there were two moments in particular where that happened. When, um, when, when the, sorry, when the cross-examination began, uh, basically Fitzgerald was trying to get him to talk about the prison, U.S. prison conditions and whether Assange should be sent there. He, he asked him, would it be appropriate to put someone suffering from depression and isolation in prison? And um, Blackwood said that depressed people can be treated in isolation, but it, the, there is a potential to exacerbate mental illness depends on what's available to him uh, beyond telephone calls, access to social networks and that. Um, Fitzgerald asked if he, but if he's deprived of these things, would it seriously exacerbate his condition? And Blackwood admitted it may do. Fitzgerald interjected, it clearly would. And Blackwood said, Mr. Sanchez has proven himself a very resilient man. Fitzgerald then asked Blackwood, was he aware of medical recommendations that prison isolation should be avoided with prisoners who have mental issues, Blackwood admitted he had, and he wanted to know whether uh, he knew that of all the suicides in US prisons, 50% of them are from inmates who are in isolation, who are in solitary confinement, but that the total percentage of the US prison population that are in solitary confinement is only three to 8%. So this very small part of the US prison population accounts for 50% of all the suicides in US prisons. Uh, the way Blackwood rebutted that was to say that no matter what those statistics say, there's still a higher rate of suicide in British prisons than in US prisons. That came up yesterday in the defense, uh, sorry, in the prosecution witness as well. So there, the, the prosecution, the government trying to make the point that it's worse in a British prison, there's more suicide in a British prison, so that should not prevent Assange from being extradited to a U.S. prison, because they're looking at equivalency here between British and American prisons. If the defense can demonstrate that the U.S. prison is a hellhole and that it's far more inhumane than any prison in, in the United Kingdom, then that's an argument why not to extradite him, because there has to be dual criminality in the law and an equivalency in the prison system. So again, Blackwood said there are more suicides in Britain, now Fitzgerald then asked, would it directly now, not just in general about its patient with, with depression, but would it be wise to send Mr. Assange, given his condition, to be sent to isolation? And Blackwood responded, depends again on the individual settings. And he pointed out that with COVID-19 in the British prisons, there was a great fear that there would be an escalation of suicides and that hadn't been borne out. So we have to be careful with we have to be careful with uh, predictions. Uh, here is a really, there were two moments here, I think, that I really want to concentrate on. Um, the first one was we heard in the morning testimony on direct examination that Assange had been sent to the prison ward in June 2019. And we all remember when he was sent there, people who are following Assange's case closely. He was in the general population. He was then sent, in, sent to an isolation medical ward or the prison hospital. And he was there isolated. And nobody knew exactly why that happened. Uh, was there some serious health issue that he had? That's what one would assume. But no, it was, and I, I was told this by someone at the time uh, on background off the record. I never reported it. I never mentioned it. I'm not going to say who told me, but someone who was in a position to know that the reason Assange was sent to that medical war, basically in isolation, was because of the video that leaked out in June of 2019 that Rupley got a hold of and put on the internet. And many, every one of us saw that, where Assange seems to be smiling and laughing and conversing with prisoners. And uh, it was clearly someone holding a telephone phone, a video camera, and somehow this got leaked out of the prison. Nobody really knows exactly how that happened. 
if there was an investigation, it was never made public, who took the video, how it got leaked outside to be shown. But it was because of that video that Assange was sent to isolation in the medical ward. This is what uh, Blackwood admitted. So uh, that's what I'd heard, and that's confirmed in the courtroom today, that that's why he was sent to the medical ward, because of that video. So on cross-examination, Fitzgerald asked him if he was aware that at 2.30 p.m. on that very day that he was sent to isolation after the video, that prison notes show that he exhibited ideations or ideas or some indications of he was thinking of self-harm that day. Now, why wasn't that in your report, Mr. Blackwood? Mr. Fitzgerald wanted to know. Why would he leave out that on the very day that they sent him to the medical ward, he indeed had in some way acted out that it was noted that he may harm himself. And that's why they sent him there. And that's an enormously important thing to leave out and shows in frankly bias. He had been behaving that way for a few days. I believe it was at 2.30 that day that they sent him there that they put that in there. Now, uh, Fitzgerald is, sorry, Lewis is fond of trying to show, uh, uncover bias in the witnesses he's cross-examining and with some monicum, monicum of success, I don't think very much, but here Fitzgerald exposed enormous bias in Blackwood who failed to mention in his written testimony that these examinations are based on that, that Assange had exhibited this uh, tendency towards self-harm. And that's the main reason he went to the ward or one of the reasons he admitted, yes, there were many factors and that was probably one of them. But why didn't you put it in your report, Mr. Blackwood? Uh, another thing Blackwood said was the he ex he expanded a little bit on the reason why they sent him there because of the film that the video that was leaked out caused reputational damage to prison officials. In other words, they were ticked off that a that a prisoner was able to make a video and re leak it from their high security Belmarsh prison. That shows they're not doing a very good job. Uh, you know, the government and others who look at the performance of prison governor and officials would see that that's not, uh, that's not a very good thing if you're running a high security prison to allow a video to get out. So they were they were embarrassed and they took it out on Assange basically. It was reputational. This was one of the reasons, but the other one was, and it was noted there that he had tendency towards self-harm over several days. And the second time that Fitzgerald was able to get Blackwood um, exposed, is when the discussion began about what conditions Assange would face if he were to be extradited to the US and where he would be held. And he would initially be held, everyone seems to agree, in Alexandria Detention Center. It's next to the courthouse in Alexandria. I actually live in Alexandria, so I've been that by that courthouse. I've been in that courthouse. So I, I know the area. That's where Chelsea Manning was held. This is where Assange would be held. And Fitzgerald read out, as told, Blackwood, that Assange would be confined to a small cell with no exercise or fresh air, limited communication with his lawyers, no contact with prisoners. And he asked uh, Blackwood, assuming this is correct, that this would be the conditions, would those conditions be damaging with Julian, uh, Julian Assange's psychiatric history? And Blackwood admitted, yes, they, they may have an impact on his depressive disorder. After Fitzgerald described the special administrative Measures, which are this uh, even enhanced uh, solitary confinement, where even the lawyers are not able to meet in the same room with their client, but through a gate, like a confessional box, they can only speak that way to their own to their clients, not a, not physically in the same room. Uh, he asked Blackwood if, given these SAMs, these special measures, would it be damaging under those conditions to send somebody like Assange? And his response, Blackwood, was that there's a range of approaches on the SAMs. And, and the one that, that Fitzgerald was describing is the most pessimistic, he said. But if that pertained, yes, they had a potential to, uh, to impact his mood state, but I maintain his mood state is manageable. So basically, Blackwood is saying, even if he's sent under the most pessimistic scenario of the detention at Alexandria of the special administrative measures, and even then, he maintains that his mood state is manageable. And Fitzgerald interjected and said, even in these conditions, 
He couldn't believe that he would say that. And the response from Blackwood was, and this is where he was exposed, he drew on U.S. Attorney Gordon Cromberg's testimony, his affidavit. And again, Cromberg is not making himself available to the court to be cross-examined. He wrote this 36-page uh, affidavit. This is the government's position. The government is presenting it as the absolute truth. And this government witness also seemed to accept it as absolute truth because he says he drew on Cromberg, who wrote that in Virginia, there's broad equivalency with Britain, British prison conditions. And that he wrote, Cromberg did, that there is no solitary confinement in the Alexandria Detention Center. Now, this brought absolute uh, incredulity to uh, Fitzgerald, the defense attorney cross-examining him. He's asking him, did you simply re rely only on Cromberg? Why are you saying there's no solitary confinement in the ADC? And Blackwood said, because I'm drawing on Cromberg. So uh, Fitzgerald says, Cromberg says there's no solitary in the ADC, and you just put it in your report like that? This is what I'm drawing on, Blackwood said. Fitzgerald, don't you think that the statement of Cromberg, a government official, which we say is incorrect, is open to question? You're only taking this from Cromberg. Shouldn't you have seen what the defense has to say on this? And again, he said he relied, uh, Blackwood did on Cromberg and the academic literature, or what happens in U.S. prisons. There may be stuff that isn't covered there, but there's broad equivalency. So he never put into his report a, not only the defense's position on this, but Maureen Baird is, uh, wrote a report about the conditions in Alexander Detention Center, and she's an expert on that, and she said there's solitary confinement there. So just because Cromberg said there isn't solitary confinement was enough for Blackwood, who later admitted he'd never been in a federal prison or any federal facility in the USA at all, only in a Connecticut state prison and in a jail in Newport, Rhode Island. He's never even visited a federal prison. He's nowhere near an expert on that. He's relying only on the academic literature and Cromberg to say what the conditions would be. This is all significant because, again, the judge has to decide uh, whether Assange is going to be sent to something worse than he would have in a, great, in a British prison. She has to decide whether his mental uh, health is robust enough to withstand these American prison conditions that are being described by the defense. And then there was one more uh, kind of bombshell situation that came up. When uh, Fitzgerald asked Blackwood, why did he put in his report that it would not be unjust to send Assange to the United States? He, as Fitzgerald strongly pointed out, that that is only up to the judge to decide. Not you. And he meekly said, yes, yes, of course, it's only up to the judge. So why, and again, Fitzgerald said, why are you entering something in your report? That's up to the judge. And he said, it's up to the judge. Twice. It was an embarrassing moment for Blackwood, where he went much further than he had to, to put in what he thought the conclusion of this entire process should be. He's only supposed to state the facts of his mental health. And the prison conditions, whether he thought that they were equivalent to Britain or not. That's basically what he was, from my understanding, <coughs> narrowed down to. But instead, he actually made a decision, like saying, this is what I would decide if I were the judge. But of course, he isn't the judge. Now, the last part of the testimony was something because you see the camera swung over to Assange, sitting with his uh, surgical mask in this glass box. And then we heard a uh, moving testimony from Sandra Crosby. She's an American doctor, general practitioner in Massachusetts, who three times visited Assange in the embassy uh, of Ecuador, and then uh, twice in Belmar. She has had five visits with him. And she described his physical uh, ailments. And again, we are going to limit what we're saying here because of the request of the Assange and his family members. So we did learn a lot more about uh, his physical conditions that were worse than anything we've thought. He, she, we knew about his tooth. She spoke uh, that he had an abscess tooth, an infection, and she spoke at length about that, how worrying she was. And she said at one point she couldn't convince him to leave the embassy to get it treated because she, uh, he, he realized what would happen to him because of the consequences. And on the cross-examination by Lewis of Crosby, he, he, he latched on something she said where 
uh, he was confined to the embassy. And this is the long, one of the long-standing anti-Assange memes here that he could leave any time he wanted to. And this is basically what Lewis is saying. He could have left. He's not. He wasn't imprisoned in the embassy. And she had an interesting response. She said, it's complicated, that question. And she felt he saw this as if someone was coming after him with an ax or a knife or a gun, and that he locked himself in a room to be safe. That was a very, very good analogy that clearly explained, I think, why Assange could not step outside. Because the British government had said clearly that the British police, I think it was the, the, the foreign secretary, I think, said that the British police were wait, waiting with welcoming arms if he steps out of the embassy to, to arrest him. That was clear. So the idea that he could leave any time he wanted to without being arrested and extradited to the United States, which they poo-pooed, that was his fear. Now we know, obviously, it's true because we're in the second week, the end of the second week of this extradition hearing to the United States. Crosby uh, uh, was challenged because she's not a psychiatrist, but in, in she has testified about psychological matters. She's a general practitioner, but uh, so she spoke mostly about his physical condition. And if uh, anyone in that room was not moved by it, then they're the kind of person who is in a government that has been dropping numerous bombs on nations since the end of the Second World War, wiping out millions, basically, of innocent civilians in their quest for world domination. This is what came across my mind. So if they can do that, this government, it's child's play for them to destroy this one man who tried to expose all of that. This is Joe Laurie reporting to CN Live. Before I go, I, welcome, I ask you again to go to patreon.com backslash CN Live to help keep these broadcasts on the air. Bye-bye.